gathering in it to us. Now let's go to God's Word together. And it is uh, in John chapter 14, verses 27 to 31. And we are going to read it responsively. And then I'm going to start with verse 24. And then we're going to respond with uh, 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 even verses. Okay, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and then I will come to you. If you loved me, and you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Verse 29, I read, And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Verse 31, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Amen. Let's pray. God, we look to you for your word, through your Holy Spirit, that you speak to us as a father to your children. Encourage and strengthen us. Those that need to be comforted, we pray that you will speak peace into our setting. But Lord, those that are too comfortable, we pray that you will also challenge us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, right now we're going through uh, the section in the scripture. It's called Farewell Discourse or Upper Room Discourse where Jesus right before going to the cross and took time to teach the disciples important truths that will help them, prepare them for difficult things that was going to come. They were going to see Jesus uh, taken and betrayed and be crucified. And they were going to be devastated. And as Jesus is talking to them, I'm going to go and die and I'm going to leave you. And uh, terrible things are going to happen to you. And disciples were confused and then they were devastated and then they were going through a difficult time. In the midst of it, and Jesus told them a few things. Uh, that's uh, helping them. And so that it will be an anchor. It was going to be an anchor for them. It was going to guide them. And one of the things that Jesus mentioned is, I'm going to go and die, but this is to prepare a place. See, after everything is done, you know, I'm going to go ahead of you so that there will be a home, eternal home, that will be prepared because of my death. And then Jesus also mentioned, as we talked about it last Sunday, I am going to send you Holy Spirit. Just like I'm with you, guiding you and helping you and leading you, strengthening you. Holy Spirit, when he comes, and he is going to come and then help you and be your leader, guide. And then he's going to be your advocate. And paracleo, an advocate together with you. And then we talked about that last Sunday. Today, one of the things that Jesus is also teaching and reminding the disciples and reminding you and me is this. And Jesus says, I am giving you peace so that you will experience peace and have this peace in the midst of difficult things that you are going to go through. I am giving you peace. And that's what today's section is about. Um, are you in the midst of a storm or difficult things? Uh, perhaps some of you are. Uh, living in a day nowadays, uh, so many anxieties and so many things uh, uh, demanding of you, and it's so difficult to just uh, make it through week by week. Uh, perhaps if you're not going through a difficult times, and don't worry, it's going to come to you, okay? You will find yourself in a storm. But as you find yourself in a storm, uh, what are some of the things that's going to help you? What's going to guide you? Today's passage, we want to think about one big thing that Jesus is talking to you and me, that he gives peace in the midst of difficulties. Here, verse 27, he says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, and let not your heart be troubled. Here, it's interesting. Jesus is not just wishing peace 
But here Jesus is reminding us that he's the giver of peace. Uh, how does the world give peace or wish peace? And sometimes when people greet one another, 안녕하세요 or shalom, and then it's the, the word that people use, wishing that things will go well and that they will have a good time and then things will go well so that uh, you know they will experience some sort of a peace and uh, that's not much in difficulties and that's kind of what people do wishing shalom or annyeong or those are wishing words but are they going to have peace and uh, that's another thing but but they're wishing even when people say adios and then I hope that circumstance, everything that's going to happen will be committed to God and then hopefully God will help you in the midst of it. Even in our greetings, we know that and the, the people say, oh, I hope and I wish that things will go well so that you will experience peace. Uh, how do others uh, also allow you to have some peace uh, when they have to just to do some changes and control the environment, circumstances, so that they will have some control over the situation that you may be in. For example, like if you have two kids uh, uh, at home and they're fighting because they want a bigger piece of pizza, and then you know, what you need to do is, hey, you get one, you get another. If you want to take your brothers away, you know, you are going to lose even your peace and then you have to put some structure there and then you need to make sure the situation is under control so that they will not experience pain and they will not experience the conflict. You know, the words uh, that, this, that says something like peacekeeping troops. You know, they have to have, you know, soldiers with guns so that people under their control will experience peace. And then we hear things like that, and that's the kind of peace that people experience. Uh, not having conflicts, of course, that's really good, uh, but that's the peace that the world gives. What do you do? You know, if you have a problem and conflict, you know, some people say, hey, you know what, forget about it, don't even think about it and perhaps it will go away. Or some people say, you know what, run away, run away, go take a vacation or go get drunk or something so that, that you will not even think about it. And that's how sometimes people deal with the conflicts and the issues that make it difficult for them to live. But here, Jesus says, peace I give to you. And then Jesus goes on and says, peace I am going to leave to you my peace I am giving to you. How is it that Jesus is able to give peace that no company and no army and no government can control and then manufacture and then make sure? It's because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. That he is the Lord of Peace and then he's able to give peace to you no matter what kind of setting that you may be in. Do you remember the story when the, Jesus was in a boat together with the, the disciples and storm came? And the disciples were panicking. And they're like, what do we do? What do we do? And what do we do? And they're trying to do their very best to, to start, put everything under control, but they just couldn't do it. And then they woke up Jesus. Jesus, wake up. Do you not care what we are going through? And then we're going to die. We're going to drown. What do you doing sleeping and then Jesus woke up and then looked at the storm and commanded to be still and then turned to the disciples why do you not have faith why do you not have faith why is it that Jesus is able to command the storm to be still is because we know from the passage and through other passages where Jesus walked on the storm and other things that we know that Jesus is the Lord who has authority over even the nature and even the storm and even all those difficult things that he has authority over that. He's the Lord. 
of nature. And that's what we see. But, you know, much more, we see that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You know, during Christmas season, as we hear passages and preaching <coughs> sermons about how for unto us a son is given, how Jesus came as a Messiah, and then upon him is a wonderful counselor, and he's a, you know, the everlasting father, and then he is the prince of peace upon his shoulder the government will continue to increase and the increase of peace will continue and it speaks about jesus being the messiah and characteristic of the kingdom where jesus is a king is that it's a kingdom characterized by peace not only does Jesus experience peace, he is the Lord of the universe and Lord of the nature, but strange thing, and then he is able to give peace to every person that becomes a part of his kingdom. And more and more people come and be a part, and they will experience the peace. And then it will be a kingdom of peace. And that's what we know here. Jesus says, peace I leave you, and peace I give to you, my peace. Here, Jesus is talking to the disciples the night before Jesus is going to die on the cross. And here Jesus is saying something about his death and how that is connected to the peace that he is offering. Jesus is saying, yes, I'm going to go and die. But through my death, you will be able to receive peace that I am giving to you. You see, when we think about peace in the scriptural sense, and then there is peace with God, and that is the biggest thing. And then there is peace with one another, through which that, through the cross that Jesus allows us to have, and the peace among people, and then peace with ourselves and with our own self okay you know even if when things are fine you do not really have the peace true shalom jesus is offering if you do not have peace with god you know if your relationship with your friends are going fine but if you are keep thinking and struggling with guilt, shame, and what to do with fear that you're struggling with, you do not know the peace that Jesus is talking about. But here, Jesus is talking about this true shalom, true shalom that is holistic, that is involved with relationship, that is renewed and right with God, and then restore relationship, peace with others, and peace with yourself as well you know one way to think about sin is a sin is something that shatters it shatters the relationship with you and god and relationship with others and even your own relationship but the cross of jesus christ and what god and what jesus offer renews and restores and then gives you shalom and that's what we see here Jesus here says, I'm leaving you peace. After his death and resurrection, when he appeared to disciples, he said, peace be with you. Again, after resurrection, peace be with you. Again, peace be with you. You see, the cause of all the brokenness, which is sin, because Jesus took that upon himself. Every debt that needs to be paid, every punishment that needs to be paid for, and Jesus took it upon himself to pay for everything, and through his death, Jesus paid for what was required so that he is able to say it is finished, and he is able to say Yes, I give you peace. You see, if you want to experience peace, whatever the situation that you may be, you need to have Jesus in your life because he can give you peace with God. 
peace with others and even with yourself that you can begin to experience how Jesus through his death and how through his death now we can experience the acceptance that we can experience from the Father and then how we can begin to be people that are accepted, loved by God and they have this renewed relationship with him. Jesus is able to give you peace. Jesus paid for everything. And that's why he's able to give you peace. In a way here when he's talking about, I'm going to go die in your place. And then what I'm going to leave for you as an inheritance, it's going to be life as a, a child of God and peace. Because Jesus paid for it all, he's able to give to us. And then we could experience his peace. Second thing that we want to think together is this. Your heart, that is, that may be full of fear, may share and indicate and then reveal to you something about you and your relationship with God. The heart of fear. Here, verse 27, when Jesus says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you, but let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Can you have peace and still experience sadness? You know, in the scripture, there is no command that says, don't be sad. And sometimes people may think like, oh, we need to rejoice. That means we cannot be sad. We need to always smile. No, there is no Bible verse that says, don't be sad. But there are 365 Bible verses that reminds you, do not be afraid. Because you cannot have fear that terrorizing your heart and experience God's peace because it reveals something about you and your relationship with God. You know, I was uh, doing some concordance search and then to be afraid or not be afraid. And then when I hit the, you know, the search, the very first time that it showed up, to be afraid or not be afraid was in Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, and that's when fear crept in and they first experienced fear as a consequence of sin. Let me try to say it this way. When God created Adam and Eve and placed them in the, uh, the garden, uh, God came. Every day they took a walk and when God came near, their response was that of joy. And they jumped up and down and they talked together, walked together and talked about a lot of things and they had fun time together. But during, in the midst of it, uh, enemy, the serpent came and began to put some thoughts like this. You know what? God is really shortchanging you. God is really keeping the best things away from you. You know what? You really are under his thumb, aren't you? God has everything under control, and then you have to do everything that he tells you to do, right? You will find true freedom when you do whatever that you want to do. So Adam and Eve began to feel and fear that they're being shortchanged. God is keeping good things from me. And so they said, God, I'm going to do it on my own. I don't need you anymore. Thank you very much. And pushed God away. And then they began to experience not only shame and guilt, but they experienced this fear. Fear. Try to think about it this way. If you are a little kid, you know, then you know, your dad and takes you to a huge mall. You know, in, this, in Chicago, there's a mall called Woodfield Mall. It's a pretty big mall. And then you go there. And then if you go there together with dad and your three, four-year-old kid, and then you're holding dad's hand, and then you don't have to worry a lot about what's going to happen and then what you are going to do. But when you begin to say, dad, 
I'm mature enough. I know what's going on. I know what to do. Please, step aside. And then when this little kid begins to wander off and does it on his own, you know, for 30 minutes, an hour, maybe fine. But usually the experience is after a little bit. If she or he does not see a person that's familiar or does not see things that are familiar, and they are going to begin to panic. And then when they see a big person coming, oh, is that person going to hurt me? Or if there is a strange place, is that going to be a good place? On their own, they begin to experience fear. You know, I remember I took uh, my little daughter to a mall, and when she was about two, two and a half, and then my wife told me, you have to take care of Irene. So I was supposed to take care of her. And then, but I just took her and said, hey, stick with me, and then come. And then I went to a gadget shop, and then I was looking around a lot of things, and then I didn't see Irene, and then I had to go all the way back, going back and forth all over the mall. I was the one that was panicking, and then I saw her in the Disney store, and I was very glad, and I never told my wife until very later. But, but picture, picture, little kid, little kid with that, she doesn't have to worry. But on her own, she needs to be strong. And then she used to be able to fight and win over others. And sometimes that's the picture. Why are we so scared and why are we so afraid of the things that we cannot control? Because we push God away. I am going to handle it on my own. And then it is bigger than what you can handle, and you're panicking. The relationship that you want, I want somebody that is perfect for me, not the person that you bring. And then as we do that, we experience more and more fear because we let go of God's hand and push him out. And then we try to be stronger and stronger and stronger. Why do we fear future? It's because we just don't know if we are going to have everything under control. But when we come to the Lord and then have his hand, cling to him, and we know not what tomorrow brings, but we know who brings it, and then we're able to say, yes, Lord, I know you are with me in the difficult situation god i'm going through sickness and then we're going through much pain and we're going through all this situation that is beyond control but i know you have a purpose you are at work underneath and behind what i do not see i know you know and i know you love I have my hand holding you. I know you love me. You know, when we are panicking and feel that things are out of control, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Check whether in your heart the fear, panic, is just taking charge of your heart because you have let go and then push God outside. I'm on my own. Leave me alone. I know what's best for me. If that's the case, what we need to do for us and for you and me to experience peace is we need to come to the Lord. Father, I am sorry. Coming back to the Father and then learning to place our hand into his hand. It's something that we need to have for us to experience his peace. I mentioned first that Jesus is peace giver, giver of peace. He will give you peace, no matter what your situation may be. And here, check your heart, whether you are leaning on him and approaching and looking at life with him, or on your own. 
it can be a pretty dark and scary place on your own. But with him, it's a different story. It is God's world. It is God's plan. It is God who is unfolding things. One more thing that we want to think here together is that through difficult situations, challenging situations that you may be in, God is cultivating you so that you can experience peace. The practice of peace, or I have it here as a fruit of the Spirit as we learn to cultivate. And there are a few things I want you to uh, pay attention and together with me. And then here, verse 28, it says, You heard me say this, I'm going away, he's talking about his death, and I will come to you. And then verse, you know, the latter part, it says, If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. You know, let me try to read it one more time. If you, he's talking to the disciple, if you really, really loved me, Jesus saying, you would rejoice about me going to the cross. But you're not rejoicing because you don't really love me. You know, Jesus is telling the disciple, now I've been telling you, I need to go to the cross. I need to die and then and, uh, pay f- uh, for the ransom for so many people. And after death and resurrection, ascension, I will go back to the Father and I will be sitting in the glory together with God. And only through then, and then you will experience forgiveness and not just you and all the others will experience uh, the blessings and peace that I have in store for them. And that's going to happen. That's why I'm going to go to the cross but disciples are saying no 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 don't say that don't say that I want you to stay just stay together with us I don't want you to leave I want you to just stay stick around with us because it's gonna be sad and it's going to be very difficult when you're not here anymore and Jesus saying look look listen what I'm going to do I'm going to go through to accomplish God's purpose And it will be for my glory. And disciples said, still, you're making us so sad. And then you're making us cry. We don't want that happen. And Jesus, as he's talking to them, Jesus is rebuking them. The reason why many times we do not experience the peace that he offers to us is because we are so preoccupied with my own happiness. Jesus, oh, I know it's going to be tough, but after this, the things will turn around and things will be different. No, please don't. Please don't. Talk about that. You know, I don't care so much about what happens to others, but my children, my family, and my future, my thing has to go well. And what you are talking to me about, winning people over to Christ and church and other things, that's good, that's good, that's good. But don't talk to me about this right now. Jesus is reminding and rebuking us. Many times we're looking at it with such a big eye focused on me, what's there for me, how it's going to help me. So we are missing the obvious that Christ is doing in our midst. Here he says, you know what? You need to ask the Holy Spirit to do some surgery in your heart. So that in your heart that you will really love Jesus. Not just with the songs that you sing. Not just with the lip service. But in your heart. What Christ desire will be really what you desire. And that's what Jesus is saying. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to pull away the weed in us. So that it will not sap the juice and life that we have with the Lord, but that we may learn to delight and rejoice what Jesus is doing and what he loves. But another thing that we see here 
is this verse 29. Now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. And then even earlier, verse 28, he said, You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. But here, what Jesus is gently rebuking also is this. You're not listening to me. You're not paying attention to what I'm saying to you. I've been telling you, this has to happen. And then after that, the resurrection and many other things will happen. But you're not listening. You're not getting it. And you're not living it. And you say, yes, 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 but please do not go. Because you're not listening. Let my words sink in. to your heart and to your life and begin to let God's word, my word, control and dominate your life and live according to my words. I think that's what Jesus is saying. So many times as we go to God's word, God gives you a word, a promise. But sometimes when difficulty comes, you let it go. so easily and then let the circumstance overwhelm you as if as if there is no god and then there is no future and no possibility of ever going through and then overcoming even when god's word constantly reminds you to not to look at the circumstance but look to god you see one of the sections in romans 8 You know, one of the very famous passages for you and for me. You know, Paul is going through the things that could really make him paralyzed and then scared and fearful. But, But he talks about it like this. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution and famine, nakedness or danger or sore, Can they overwhelm us? When God's word says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? Who is going to condemn those that he died for and raised up? And then who shall separate us from the love of Christ and love of God? Neither. persecution, tribulation, distress, famine, nakedness, danger, or sore. For I am sure neither death nor life, angel, rulers, or things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation are able to separate you and me from the love of God. in Christ Jesus. You know, what Paul is reminding and charging us is this. Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to your feeling of response and reaction when things come? I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Or what people say, you're in big trouble. Or are you going to listen to what Jesus says? Through my death, I purchased you. There is nothing that will separate you from the love of God. Nobody is going to take you and snatch you away from my hand because of what he has done. You know what we need to do is we need to spend more time reading God's word and ask the Holy Spirit to bring it to our mind and not just bring it to our mind, drill it and make it sink in. so that our lives will not be led by the circumstance and however you feel, but that it will be led by God's truth. Even if you do not see what's ahead of you when God's word is the lamp unto your path, you're able to trust Him. God, even if my life, physical life may end here, I know I will be with you forever. I know treasures are mine, and I know and you are together 
with me. You know, how do we grow in an, as we allow Holy Spirit to do a heart surgery in us and then as we learn to pay attention to God's Word, memorize it, meditate upon it, and then build your life on it. But one more thing that I want you to just listen together. In the very familiar passage in Philippians 4, you know the passage, Philippians 4. When things are looking bad or things make you worried, Jesus, Paul here says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Listen to this again. If things look pretty bad and you don't know what's going to happen and you don't see God's hand where you are, talk to God. And talk to God about everything and excessively and talk to Him about all the things, how you're feeling, what you think, and then how you see about everything. Here, He says prayer. Oh, that's praying to God, right? Supplication. What is supplication? Supplication is asking God to help you. Okay? And then thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a form of prayer. When you talk to God, thank you for helping me. God, give you praise for what you have done listening to my prayer. And then letting your request be known. That's another form of praying. When things look bad and then when you are panicking, talk to God. Talk to God. And let God hear what you're feeling, what you're thinking, and how you assess things. And so that He will listen to you, so that He will talk back to you, so that He will shed light and guide you, so that He will strengthen you, so that He will open a way out, so that you can stand up under it, so that He will just do what He loves to do, so that He will be glorified in that situation. That's what we can see from this passage. In the midst of difficult situation, yes, no, that Christ, because He paid for it all, because He's the King of peace and Prince of peace, He's able to give peace in your situation where you are and check your heart whether you're holding on to sticking to and walking with God and experiencing his peace and in the midst of whatever that you may be at cultivate his presence and his peace so that you will experience him giving you a testimony you know, earlier we sang this hymn, and uh, the praise team led this hymn, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you think this song and hymn was written out of uh, everything that was going fine? No. You know, and we know, this song is a testimony in the midst of a difficult thing. But he experienced Christ's presence and peace because of what Jesus has done and Jesus' purpose. A gentleman named Horatio Spafford was a businessman in Chicago. And then 100 some years ago, when there was a Chicago fire that wiped out the whole city, whole city and then his business was all burnt and then he told his wife and three daughters to go and to England while he just salvaged whatever he can and to take care of the business and join them later in few days and few weeks he receives a little telegram and saying the ship sank and she the wife only survived and then receiving a telegram, and then he got on the next ship to England. And as she was passing the very same place where the ship sank, and then three daughters perished, 
and she was out that evening. Making this song praise unto the Lord. When peace like a river attended my way, when sour like sea below roll, whatever my lot thou have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Lord, haste the day when the fate shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumpet shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. I'm not saying that she was not feeling pain and sadness. No, there was pain and sadness, but there was peace because he was together with the Lord and had his hand with him holding it. I don't know what the situation that you may be in, but the message for me and for you is this. Jesus gives peace that no world can imagine. When your heart is not right with God. Even a believer experiencing panic and fear. Oh, what am I going to do? Am I gonna, ever going to get married? Am I gonna, ever going to get a good job? It's ever going to do... No. Hold his hand. In the midst of the situation, Learn to allow Holy Spirit cultivate your relationship with Him so that in the midst of difficulties or whatever it may be, others around you may be able to experience peace that you experience. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding that makes everybody boggle their mind and what's going on? How is it that you are going through such a difficult thing? And then you are able to be at peace. May Christ's peace in you and your life be the way that will display His glory unto Him. Let's pray. Would you take short time and just to respond? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart as you talk to Him, as you depend on Him, and look to Him. If you need to come to the Lord, Lord, I was telling you, step out and stay out too long. I want to place my hand in your hand. Lord, I want to cling to you. I want to say, I need you. I love you. I want to depend on you. I love you.